Hello, everyone. Welcome to Zoom again. Hmm. Hi, Francesco. It's nice to see you. Hi, Sheer. Lovely to see you. We're going to give uh, participants a, a minute or so to zoom in with us, and then we get started with the program as usual. Of course. And let me begin by wishing you and everybody who's joining us today happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to everyone who's uh, with us today. Yeah. And uh, as always, we'd love to hear from people where they're connecting from. So you, if you can use the chat to do that, that's great. But uh, let's just uh, maybe wait another 15, 20 mm -hmm. seconds. I still I see still people uh, joining. So let's see what where that takes us and then we yeah. get started. Wonderful. I'll also take this opportunity to apologize for my voice that's been coming in and out this whole this past week, um, like the weather. <laughs> Oh, sorry, it's not what I want. This is what I want. There's the wrong, the wrong uh, uh, thing. I realized I don't have the Magnus in my background as usual, but uh, yes, uh, I, that's I true. That I can do that. Well, welcome to zooming in, everybody who's joining us today. We're happy to to have you with us. Uh, this, these are our weekly curatorial curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. I'm Shil Galkuchavi, assistant curator, and with me is Francesca Spagnolo, our curator. Hi, Francesca. Hi, Shir. And um, I, I can hear you a little bit faintly, and I, I know your voice went down this week, but if you can speak a little closer Absolutely. to the microphone, I think everybody will, will hear us. Yes, yeah, zooming in and just, uh, just reminding everybody of the rules of engagement here. Yes. And, um, um, and uh, this is the second to last uh meeting uh and uh, conversation for this uh, semester for the fall uh, we started in in, uh, in august and we're continuing into into december and and covering the week of hanukkah essentially because we'll when we start today with the sec tonight is the second night of hanukkah and it continues to the end of the festival and both this week and next week we're we're talking about hanukkah lamps but let's uh, again remind everyone that this is a zoom webinar Yes, everybody's cameras are turned off, but you're welcome to interact with us in two ways. You can use the chat button on the bottom of your screen to let us know if you have any technical difficulties or to just wish us happy Hanukkah and to let us know where you're joining us from, which we'll be delighted to know. You can also use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen right next to the chat to ask us any questions um, and we'll spend a few minutes at the end of the talk uh, hoping to answer each and every one of you. As a quick reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only collection, uh, Jewish collection associated with a major research university, University of California, Berkeley, of course. So allow us to begin our talk today about Hanukkah lamps and the beautiful festival of Hanukkah. Yeah, so we, we sure and I have spent uh, uh, some time going through uh, the over 200, close to 250 Hanukkah lamps in the in the holdings of the Magnus, as you were saying, one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world. So there is plenty to see. We're not going to show all 250 of them today, just a, a few selections. But uh, together, we're also going to explore what is it that we can learn from the shape of Hanukkah lamps. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna go kind of modern, early modern to modern in in this presentation. We. We don't go back in time too much, and even though we'll elicit the the the, the role of the menorah of the of the of the lamp, uh, seven branch lamp of the of the temple, and even before that, the tabernacle, and we'll think about that a little bit. It, we're really kind of in a modern uh, context for for our presentation, and uh, so let's just get started. And uh, we we'll be covering four uh, key topics. Uh, we're going to be thinking about the, the passage from uh, everyday light to festival light. And a question that, that comes up uh, right away with that is, do people, meaning Jews, uh, actually need a Hanukkah lamp? Is there an, an, a ritual need for a Hanukkah lamp? Or what kind of need does it fulfill? And then we'll, we'll uh, um, work back in time, but also into the future uh, of digital uh, art and, and think together about the, the role and the the inspiration of the seven branch menorah uh, behind uh, the shape of many Hanukkah lamps. 
And uh, then we'll talk about uh, something that's very dear to us, how Jewish objects oftentimes represent space around them, either real or imagined space, or essentially the relationship with Hanukkah lamps and architecture. And finally, uh, we'll discuss and we'll go very hyper modern on, uh, on that. It's, very, it's a very 19th, 20th century kind of conversation, although we'll go back a little bit too, uh, in, in how, how these lamps uh, actually are a chance to display one's identity, personal, family, communal identity, and what, uh, what the implications are. Um, so let's get started uh, from everyday light to festival light. Uh, this is uh, what we see here, by the way, it's from the beautiful uh, Peach and Mark Levy uh, collection. It was a gift of uh, about 400 items of Judaica that uh, uh, were donated to the Magnus just a few years ago. And this uh, incredible power couple in, uh, in Santa Monica, uh, Peach and Mark Levy, who uh, they've been in, in Peach has been a guest of, of the Magnus. She, she spoke at, uh, at an exhibition opening some years back, but uh, uh, they collected thousands of objects of Judaica and turned their home in Santa Monica into a, mu a living museum uh, where people, organizations would visit, they would organize visits. And now they're also thinking about their legacy. And so if this, they destined a portion of their, of their holdings to the Magnus so that we could continue to research them and we will do this today. There are several interesting and beautiful Hanukkah lamps. This is one of them. But this one is kind of like a stand, like what we could say, I mean, it's beautiful, it's beautiful standard lamp. We see the, the shape of the menorah, just it has eight uh, uh, and then nine branches uh, 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 with it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it holds candles. I think I can, I can use my pointer to, this, mm -hmm. these are candle holders, not oil. And this is sort of like what we are, and it has a nice six pointed star at the top, and we'll get back to that uh, towards the end of our presentation today. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful silver object. It's, it, it performs well in the, in the bourgeois living room or dining room and, and so on. It's a beautiful display object and we can imagine what it takes, us, where it takes us in, the, in Germany, early 20th century, of course, not middle, not late, the early 20th century. A lot of, lot of silversmiths uh, producing uh, Jewish ritual objects at that time, um, and and so on. But uh, let's uh, let's think a bit more broadly about. Uh, so here we have a bit of a phenomenology of uh, of uh, Hanukkah lamps in front of us, all from the Magnus collection. We um, we have to begin with uh, um, oil lamps that are hanging from the ceiling and that are, can be used for regular illumination, but uh, are created with multiple beaks. In this case, eight. Uh, and can also serve the purpose, we'll, we'll, we'll review this uh, throughout yeah, our talk, can it. also serve the purpose of, of, uh, of being lit one each day, each night of Hanukkah and serve the purpose of a, of a Hanukkah lamp. But these are, these are lights that are used to oftentimes, not this one in this image, but they also have a cup underneath to collect the oil that might spill so that you know, one doesn't set one's home on fire. Uh, because that's that's one of the risks of using these lamps, and there are many with different, and we'll we'll explore more different and interesting and and beautiful shapes. Uh, most of these uh, originate from Germany, some of them also from northern Italy, and um, that's sort of like a way to have a lamp that gives light and that can also be adapted to the use of of a of a Hanukkah lamp. And then we have uh, bottom left, uh, we have. But, uh, and this is a very dear topic to us, right? Share these, Absolutely. these are lamps that uh, you can confirm. Yes. You, uh, you know, we, we can, we can spill all the beans. Shira she, she, she <laughs> has been mapping uh, Jewish museum collections worldwide for, for years, also for her dissertation work, etc. So she's very familiar with holdings throughout the world. Oftentimes you can help me with this. Uh, Shira, mm -hmm. these are described as wall hanging yes, lamps. Absolutely. And most of them originate from Italy a place where I have, with which I have a certain familiarity as we have established. Mm -hmm. And what we understand is that actually these lamps were not wall hanging originally. Well, we had to ask ourselves first, why wall hanging? After yeah. all, um, these lamps have a history, uh, Hanukkah lamps have also a history of being uh, shown in front doors and front windows, etc. So why wall hanging out of all, all options? So, Francesco, please. Yeah, and, and while, while I, I speak, Shir, if you want to find a way to keep your microphone even a little closer to your mouth, yes, because I, I you're a little soft today. I, mm -hmm. we, we I tested am. this before, but it, I guess something changed in between our tech rehearsal mm -hmm. and now. So on the bottom left, these, these uh, lamps, and they're very ubiquitous in collections, and they're often described in museum catalogs as well hanging because they were found 
hanging on the walls of people's homes, but what we, when we were collected, and so late 19th, early 20th century, or even later, but what we understand is that we're actually door hanging. They were to be hung outside the door of one's uh, apartment, home, uh, etc. In a way, not dissimilar from the, the, the Hanukkah lamps that one finds strolling the streets of Jerusalem in, uh, during, during Hanukkah, uh, these, these, um, uh, these uh, glass boxes with lights, so not really lamps, but containers of light that are, this, that are put in front of people's homes and lit and so that the, the light of Hanukkah can be shared and, and diffused outside of one's home. So door hanging, and as we can see here, they, they have little oil wells and little wicks that would, uh, that would uh, use to kindle the lights, just like the, the ones uh, hanging from ceilings. And then we have the self-sending lamps, either uh, operating with oil, like this beautiful Moroccan uh, one at the bottom, that's also an amulet, has one of the amuletic names of gods. It's also some, has symbols of fertility with the roosters, etc. So it serves, serves multiple purposes, beautiful designs, uh, arboreal tree designs and so on, or can they also be self-standing? We, we in, in, in the jargon of, of, of curators, we call the, we refer to these as bench, mm -hmm. right? Bench lamps, because they are, they are kind of on, on a bench form, etc. And this one it was designed to have candles and also, and we'll talk more about this, double up as a, as a Shabbat, mm -hmm. as a Sabbath uh, lamp with the two, the two candles to be lit for Shabbat, and we see here, and we'll get back to that as well, has a depiction of a seven branch uh, candelabrum. And then we also find other shapes with, and big ones, self-standing big ones, and they're often used in communal, destined to communal use, so lit in the synagogue, etc. And that's when Hanukkah becomes a, more of a, the lighting of the Hanukkah candles becomes more of a communal experience, which uh, coincides pretty much with the rise of Zionism and a shift in the narrative around the cultural and historical narrative around Hanukkah. So this is a, a short, quick phenomenology of various types of lamps that one finds, not just in the Magnus collection, but in, in collections worldwide. Do you think we missed anything crucial here, Shir? I really think we, we've gone over all of the basics. I just wanted to add to, um, I'm sure many of our, of our listeners today are familiar with that, with several of these examples. And, and as you know, these are highly collectible objects. They're, often quite small, quite um, easy to, to move from one place to another. And many Jewish collections, Jewish museum collections around the world have large, um, large wealth and in terms of materials um, and shapes and forms and origins of uh, Hanukkah lamps. And luck lucky for us, we are one of these collections. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that uh, to our conversation. So as, as we were saying earlier, the, a question and inspired us in, in constructing this presentation is a very simple one. Is there actually a need, a ritual need for a, for a Hanukkah lamp? The, the, the ritual need is to light, to have lights that increase in number each night of Hanukkah. And these lights are designed to be looked at, uh, so not to illuminate one's home. And hence, that's why we often have a raised uh, light or even more that are used just to provide lighting uh, to, to one's environment so that the eight lights of Hanukkah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, can be actually looked at and, and their number increases which it, it, with each night of, of use. But is there really, really a need or, or, or not for Hanukkah lamps? So if we, if we go around, we see that, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, these uh, lamps can just simply exist and be adapted to Hanukkah use. And uh, we see actually here in this uh, display, these are a few examples from, uh, from the Magnus collection. We see that some of these lamps are used with candles to provide everyday light. And then they have eight uh, oil beaks for, for, for the Hanukkah uh, festival. Or like in the case on the right, they have uh, oil, oil wells and then, and then the, the, the holdings for candles as well. So they can kind of have this dual function of, of uh, providing light for every day and also illuminating illuminating the holiday. But what's even more interesting is that uh, many Jewish groups, many Jewish cultures don't really have Hanukkah, uh, Hanukkah lamps. They will just create one for the holiday and then throw it out. So uh, it's not just consumerism, it's that mm -hmm. they will create holders for, uh, for the, for the 
lights of Hanukkah, and then they will create a new set of holders for the for the following year, and so on and so forth. They will not keep a, a light in, in their home. In a way, you know, if you if we think about it, like who needs a light with eight candles or eight oil wells uh, or year round in their home? So it's a it's a very practical approach to this. So what do we have on on the screen here? Can you guide us to that? So we have uh, so we picked two examples. Uh, we have. Um, I think a couple more in our collection. I think we picked the best two. Um, the one on the on the left is a Hanukkah lamp created in the United States in the early 20th century, and as you can see, it's made for for candles. Uh, on the you have the eight places on the the eight holders on the bottom, and then you have the the shamash, the servitor, on the top right. And in the center, of course, you have the image of the seven branch menorah, which we'll discuss in a few minutes, um, representing, of course, the, uh, the Holy Temple. And surrounding it, you have uh, the text of, of Hanukkah, you know, um, lighting the candle of Hanukkah, it says. Um, Hanukkah. All the texts that are read during the kindling the of the lights. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then on the... Uh, to, to the right, we actually have a, quite a different uh, Hanukkah lamp made in Turkey, also 20th century. And um, you also have, of course, the eight holders and on the top, in the center top, we have the holder for the servitor for the shamash. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a different shape because here we have the crown and we have the star in the middle. Um, and they're all representative, of course, for the, of the keta. Uh, going taking us back to the synagogue and of course the Keter Torah. Um, so these are all uh, Hanukkah lamps that are ephemeral, that were only used um, for you know for the one year purpose. They were and intended then, to be used once, and yes. then co collections like Collected. ours will keep them and, and make them unephemeral. Exactly. So uh, they but, became collectibles essentially, mm -hmm. and now we won't be lighting anymore uh, candles yeah. or oil in them, unfortunately. Yeah. And by the way, we do not light the Hanukkah lamps in, in no. the collection. We 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 discuss them. We look at them. We preserve them. And and and, and we appreciate and thinking. them. And also, uh, Hanukkah lamps like this one from Morocco can be made from repurposed materials. Maybe particularly colorful to entice tourists. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, that's entirely a possibility. But they can be reclaimed materials, reused and repurposed on. Uh, for the for the scope of uh, serving as as Hanukkah lamps. Yeah, here we have glass, colored mm -hmm. glass, um, and tin, and tin, probably yeah. from from like uh, you know, yeah, from like tin cans or something like that. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, we we're reminds we're all very much in love with this with this yes. object. Yeah, reminds reminds yeah. of the ones that we used to make in kindergarten and then take home, and know that the following year we'll never find them ever again. <laughs> And you know we could keep talking and exploring bottles, etc. But uh, let's uh, let's move through our plan, and because we have some some interesting materials to share. And so a reminder, and we find this very much. It's very this is very ubiquitous, especially in uh, in uh, in Hanukkah lamps. So door hanging, not wall hanging, door hanging Hanukkah lamps from Italy. Uh, these are both 18th century. Uh, examples from the collection of the Magnus. And we see that they, they have depictions of the seven branch candelabrum, which evokes the descriptions of the candelabrum itself in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the one on the left is particularly interesting because it evokes description. We see other ones also from more recent times, even, you know, the, the depictions of the of the tabernacle and then you know referring to the temple of jerusalem the lions and and so on there are all kinds of variations but uh, but oftentimes the, the seven branch candelabrum is, is present in but uh, but most of these descriptions um have to do with uh, this uh, very mysterious mystical passage from the vision the night vision of, of prophet zechariah and uh, who's uh, meeting an angel and not really understanding it's a it's a very interesting description I see. Do you mind reading it? Because part of my screen is obscured by the various controls of Zoom. Since of I'm course, still. I'll read the area that we, that we marked. Yeah. I see a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl above it. The lamps on it are seven in number, and the lamps above it have seven pipes. And by it are two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and one on its, on its left. And I'll go down to the bottom. Do you not know what these things mean? Asked the angel who, who talked with, with me. And I said, no, my Lord. 
So it's a it's a mysterious. We're not going to go into the exegesis mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, Zechariah, but uh, but in a way we did in partnership with a colleague, a beloved colleague from UC Berkeley, Professor Greg Niemeyer, uh, who is a digital artist and a professor in the Department of Art Practice. And uh, with him, I remember going through some like the ones we see on screen and other Hanukkah lamps and depictions of the of the seven branch candelabra, and then. Uh, Greg, uh, so this is part of, uh, we have highlighted in our presentations, the ongoing collaborations between the Magnus Collection and artists, uh, students and faculty at UC Berkeley and beyond actually. And, uh, and Greg Niemeyer created this uh, night vision, which is uh, based on data there, all of the blurred images that, that one sees on the screen. This is just a screen capture of a, of a it's so software based, it keeps changing color schemes, shapes, it's, Etc. But uh, one of the things we worked on was the shape of the of the menorah, and uh, and in his imagination how it draws based on the visual descriptions of the vision of uh, Zechariah. Uh, so let's just watch a little snippet. And the sound, by the way, is all from uh, um, another project we did uh, of uh, playing objects, ritual objects from the Magnus collection. And so the the this soundtrack here is also from the Magnus and from objects, but it's all digital. Uh, this was on display uh, a couple of years ago in an exhibition called The Power of Attention that was uh, devoted to meditational practices in, in manuscripts and, and beyond. And then this uh, artwork actually traveled last year, 2019, when the exhibitions could still travel, and traveled to, to, to Amsterdam, where it was uh, displayed in an exhibition on, on mysticism in Kabbalah, the Jewish Museum in, uh, in the city of Amsterdam. So here, let's see if we can do this. And little by little, what we see on the screen is the drawing of the shape of the Nora and then the, the flow of water and, uh, uh, and all of the elements from the vision of Zechariah. And uh, all of this is, of course, archived and visible on the Magnus website, magnus.berkeley.edu. It can be searched. And um, we're going to leave this project behind now and move on uh, with our presentation. But uh, this is uh, something that we cherish from from uh, ways in which we make this uh, collection interact with the visions of artists and the, I guess also the visions of prophets in, in a way. Uh, and we're going back to prophets uh, yes, in a minute, so. uh, but we'll start with looking a little more deeply and more directly at our Hanukkah lamps. And these two examples were made in Morocco um, in 18th and 19th century Hanukkah lamps. And as you saw, as, as you see on your right, I added an image from a beautiful um, um, restored sanctuary uh, from the synagogue, Jewish synagogue called Saint Fez. And you see the remnants of these kinds of arches as they appear also in the two, in the two Hanukkah lamps, in the, back, in the back plates of the Hanukkah lamps. And of course, um, in working and preparing for this presentation, Francesca and I were thinking a lot about the architecture and how this, these Hanukkah lamps can represent these communal spaces, but of course we also light a lot of these smaller Hanukkah lamps in our homes, in our private homes, and thinking about whether these Hanukkah lamps represent our homes or our communal spaces is something that we are constantly looking, looking at and thinking about. Uh, in the next slide, we've got a couple of different examples, um, one from, one made to your, on your left from, uh, from Central Europe that really represents a very lavish uh, probably synagogue based on the center of this land. It also looks see. a little bit like we're in some kind of uh, church. Yes, it could be. It's a holy, yeah. holy space. Um, it's definitely a holy space with uh, different and then, elements. 
And then on your, on your right is actually an, an artist from Jerusalem who created this beautiful lamp. And of course you see that uh, on the bottom you have the, the eight areas for lighting the eight candles and on top in that little hole there is the place for the servitor, the shamash. And then you see that this is actually quite a building. It almost looks like it was built during the Ottoman period uh, or earlier in Jerusalem. It's not a very, it's not something that you all that you see traditionally in some of the more modern buildings around here. Um, so I think it makes you question what the artist was, was thinking about and looking at. And then finally, we have this beautiful miniature uh, Hanukkah lamp that is so special to us and is made probably in the mid 19th century, which really has. Um, this really this little window in the center of it. And of course, it's it's not just a window. It's probably a Torah ark, surrounded by the two um, the two poles. With above them, you see um, the lions, and above and above on the top, you see on the top of the Hanukkah lamp, you actually see the crown. Once again, the Torah crown. And this Hanukkah lamp was probably also used for Shabbat as well as for Hanukkah, based on the two it has the two um, lights on the, the sides. Two lights yeah. on the sides. <clears throat> Um, so this this is an object can be used all year round essentially. Mm -hmm. So you would, it, it's it's an economy of space and even <laughs> kind of in, includes a whole synagogue. Like one could have a mm -hmm. Kanukah lamp and a synagogue all at all home, at home. Uh, sitting somewhere on the <laughs> yeah, and use it <laughs> on, week, on a weekly basis. So it's a constant reminder uh, yeah. of the holiness. But of course, that's not where where it ends. Uh, Hanukkah lamps are are so imaginative and so creative. And of course they display our identity, personal identity of the people who, who it was made for or the owners. And actually Francesca, since I know that uh, both of us adore this lamp, I know that you're our Italian representative in this talk. I would really appreciate you. <clears throat> well, this is a, you know, a lamp that has both a visual pun and, and uh, essentially through the visual pun contains a family name it belonged to a family called Della Torre, which in Italian means of the tower. And uh, the references are also biblical and Sur, the tower, the, the, the tower of, uh, of Israel, the, the rock of Israel is embedded in this, in this image. But uh, it, it was one of the family emblems. We've, we studied Italian family emblems early on in, in our presentations. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, this doesn't have somebody's name written on it, but even better, it represents a whole family. So it's, it's probably heirloom. <laughs> And again, this is a door hanging lamp. So I, we, we can imagine members of the De La Torre family from northern, the northwest of Italy uh, using this lamp to display their identity outside and inside their home. Um, and we have other examples of uh, lamps that have names of families, individuals. Uh, in this case here, we have uh, a lamp that was collected in, in, in uh, Egypt, but really originates from Corfu, from the Greek island of Corfu. And we know this from the last name uh, this is named after a, a gentleman called Chaim Nakamulli, Nakamulli in Hebrew, Nakamulli in, in Venetian Italian. And so we have information about, about this person. And in this case, we have a helmet from, a, from the uh, pioneer, from a pioneer unit, probably of the of a Prussian army, hard to really pinpoint it, uh, turned into a, a Hanukkah lamp, into the back plate of a Hanukkah lamp with somebody's initials, A, B, most likely the initials of, of a person, of an individual. Um, and then there are other types of there are so many, lives that but, display identity, right? But I think we might want to end today with, uh, with a bit of a band, a bit of an empower, an empowered band. And um, unfortunately, it means that we'll skip a bit of our presentation today and a couple of our more Zionistic and political statement, statements that were created um, here in, uh, in Eastern Europe, and then the next slide in, uh, in so Germany. Here we have uh, national imperial emblems that help us uh, sort of geolocate and culturally locate these lamps in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire. Uh, we're, we're big in, in looking at orbs and mm -hmm. swords Absolutely. and double-headed eagles and crowned double-headed eagles and so on. There are all kinds of variants and possibilities with these lamps. And then, of, then course, have, the of course, the arrival of the six-pointed star. Yeah, 20th century, well, 19th century, actually, like 19th century and the development of the political movements and one of them being Zionism, of course. And here to your right, we start with the right this time, is, uh, is a lamp from a synagogue in uh, Kerala. 
and on your left is actually a Hanukkah lamp, uh, collectible Hanukkah lamp from Marco. And I don't know if you can see very well, but apart from, from the six-pointed star on top, you actually have um, an engravings of the flag, uh, the Israeli flag. Or at least the Zionist is, flags. We don't Zionist know whether it's already yeah. a, an Israeli flag, probably exactly. predates that, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And in the center, of course, the seven branch menorah. Um, Seven branch menorah surmounted by a, by a six pointed star, surrounded by flags with six pointed star, and the whole lamp has another six pointed star. This is really an attestation of, of uh, sort of adherence to to the at the time emerging <laughs> ideals mm -hmm. and and political goals of Zionism. And That's the same it. is true for India, where we see these lamps pop up after 1917, the Balfour Declaration, and the spreading of Zionist ideas and Zionist possibilities uh, throughout the British Commonwealth, all the way mm -hmm. to, to India and South India. And, um, and finally, we have another example, a beautiful example that was created for the Ivriya organization, which was established um, in 1925 in New York by the Women's Division of the Jewish, of the Jewish Education Society. And the concept behind this, um, this organization was to, to include children and start teaching children uh, Jewish, basically start sending children to Jewish school. Uh, it started, of course, from New York, and then later on this movement, of course, developed to other places in the United States, and of course, exists, it exists worldwide. Um, and this was, um, this is one of several examples of these kind of beautiful Ivriya Hanukkah lamps uh, that, of course, and of course, Ivriya being also Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew woman uh, in Hebrew. Um, and I think lastly, we might want to end with a very famous uh, Hebrew woman. <laughs> um, of course, the story of, um, of Judith. Uh, Judith, who was a widow, and, um, and in order to save her, her people, she believed that she was saving her people from the, from the armies of, um, of the Vuchonesa. Um, she went to the, to the camp of, um, of her, their rivals, and of course, uh, beheaded eventually the head of the, of the army, Holofernes, and here is on the right is a beautiful painting by Atmosa Chintilesi um, of Judith beheading Holofernes. And, and, then, and of here, un until the Maccabees enter the scene as uh, heroes of the Zionist movement, uh, Judith was, Yehudit was really the hero of Hanukkah lamps, and absolutely. you can see some examples here, not from Magnus. The Jewish no. Museum on the left, Israel Museum collection on the right, and yeah. you see Judith with the sword the and holding the hanging severed head. Mm -hmm. of all and there the are furnace. several more examples, of course, yeah. um, and, in different uh, collections. But of course, she was a very feminist, very important figure. But then everything changes, of course, and the, and the story of the Maccabees becomes really the leading story of Hanukkah, of um, the, the rebellion against the Greek, and of course, the, the re rededication of the temple and the, and the, whole, and the miracle of the oil. Um, and here in the center of this, of this beautiful Hanukkah lamp, you see, of course, the rededication of the temple and the lighting of the menorah. And so the, the priests and the Maccabees, and, and, uh, and we find this iconography uh, very much spreading throughout the 20th century. So very here's an important. example also from the Magnus collection of a, of a beautiful painted uh, uh, leaf by, by Ori Sherman. And at the bottom, we see exactly the same Mm -hmm. and the rededication of the menorah. And of course, we love this depiction also because of its reference to the book of uh, Isaiah and the reference to... Um... Here, we, we have a oh, few yeah. questions and it's okay. time to, to write. I, you should have a clock in front of you. It's time yes, to absolutely. wrap this up. So let's see if we can maybe answer one or two questions and the others will answer online. Yes. Uh, and uh, if, as you go through these questions, I want to remind everybody that next week we convene again, same time at noon. Uh, next Friday, and we will talk about a, the sort of histories we've woven around a very special and specific Hanukkah lamp that you see depicted here. That was uh, that was created in a in a workshop in a displaced persons camp in Germany at the end at the end of World War Two. So we'll, and we we'll hope you can use more you can about join us. Absolutely. And I see we have, uh, we have questions, but questions. I, I cannot read them. So just you, so you want to take. I'll I'll start by answering. Um, somebody asked about the other word I used for shamash, a servitor is the other word used for shamash. It's um, basically an, an, an English translation of the, of the term. It means the light that's used to kindle the other ones, which is not a necessity, but it's often present in, in Hanukkah lamps. 
and of course, I can confirm that this uh, this presentation, as well as the others uh, prior to it and the one next week, are all recorded and they'll all appear on our website. And we're happy for you to rewatch them and share them with your friends. Um, somebody is asking, when did the hero focus change from Judith to the Maccabees? Yeah, and well, we we were basically suggesting that the big shift is the 19th, 19th century, century and the the rise of. Uh, uh, Jewish national aspirations and Jewish self-empowerment in the in the modern uh, period, and we see we really see this shift. So. Mm -hmm. Somebody is asking about the materials the Hanukkah lamps are made of. I'll invite you to look at our presentation or look at our website, and you'll find all the information about all these Hanukkah lamps, the ones we showed, and additional ones in our collection appearing there. Um, so please feel free to explore that. Um, Another person is asking, what is the most unusual or rare material used to make some of the menorahs or Hanukkah lamps, if any? Well, I think we showed a few. There, there was uh, a glass, a tin can, probably. Who knows? It was maybe a tin of sardines, <laughs> glass. Um, and then, of course, if we go into contemporary Judaica, we find all sorts of permutations. But we really didn't go there for this presentation, which I think we should wrap up uh, yes. wishing everybody again thank you uh, everybody uh, happy hanukkah and uh and uh, festival of light uh, mm -hmm. that's a more encompassing term actually than even hanukkah we didn't even talk about the names of the hanukkah lamps some other time <laughs> there is so we'll much to, to unpack week. from these objects <laughs> but we will continue next week so let's so hope you can join us in a, in a week from uh, from today next friday at noon uh, to talk about hanukkah and survival thank you Shir. Thank you, Francesco, and thank you, Ross. Thank you, thank you, Ross Calper, for, for working the, the Zoom webinar behind the scenes, and thank you, everybody who joined us today. And uh, as as a reminder, both this program and next program are very much co-sponsored by the six Bay Area JCCs, uh, who are promoting our activities and bringing to you the light from the over two hundred Hanukkah lamps from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Light at UC Berkeley. So happy Hanukkah. Happy, Happy Hanukkah. And stay safe. See you next week. Bye-bye, everybody.